Welcome to It's Your Case, presented by VetCT.com. I'm Heather, your radiologist on demand for this week. Here we have a seven-month-old golden retriever who fell from a height uh, while on a walk with the family. The owners reported that he was also underwater after he fell from the waterfall. So once you've looked at the images, then you're ready to watch this video. Many of you have already commented that you see an alveolar pattern. I actually agree that an alveolar pattern is present. However, it's not the only pattern that's present. So for those of you that said interstitial, you're right too. Let's get into this case so that we can understand how is it possible that we can all be right. And for those of you that said alveolar, double kudos to you because that's how I would have characterized this one also, despite the fact that there's more than one pattern present. How do I come to that conclusion and why does it matter? Well, what I start by doing, and I'm using the VD view here to show you, is I kind of get a look at which part of the lung is the most affected by the pathology that I see, which often comes down to which part of the lung is the most radio opaque. So I think this VD view is a nice example showing that the most radio opaque lung lobe here, as I depicted with yellow arrows, is the right caudal lung lobe. Once I've sort of looked at the area where the opacity is increased, we're going to then go and look at two normal anatomic features and their conspicuity or our ability to see them is going to help us decide about the lung pattern. I'll switch views. Uh, I think we'll use this lateral. So the left lateral is better, sorry. So what am I going to do when I'm finding the part of the lung that's most opaque? I'm going to look for two normal anatomic features. Feature one. I want to see if I can see pulmonary blood vessels. If I can identify pulmonary blood vessels, and I'm showing you an example here in the cranial lung lobe, that helps me to know that the lung adjacent to those vessels is aerated. This is because the pulmonary blood vessels are of fluid or soft tissue opacity, an aerated lung is of gas opacity. So that difference between those two opacities gives us a nice visibility of the blood vessel margin. When I go up here into our caudal dorsal lung field, the right caudal lung lobe where we were worried, I don't see pulmonary blood vessels. When I'm looking for pulmonary blood vessels, I'm looking for soft tissue opaque structures that are branching, like we see here. The second anatomic feature that I look for when I'm assessing for lung patterns is bronchi. We talked about that last week, and I said if you see lines and rings, you might be worried about a bronchial pattern. What we should remember is that those lines and rings to be a bronchial pattern need to be of soft tissue opacity. Here I've placed a line in orange just to show you an example of when a line is not a bronchial pattern. This is an example of a line that if you look at it, you can see it has a gas opacity. A line of gas opacity is not a bronchial pattern at all. A line of gas opacity is an air bronchogram. This is an example when the bronchi maintain their aeration, but peripheral to that, the lung lobe is not aerated. It's either consolidated, has increased opacity for whatever pathology is present. So here we have an example of several air bronchograms. I'm gonna point out a few with some arrows. So here's one here. I've already shown you this one. Now, for those of you that thought there was an interstitial pattern, an interstitial pattern to me is when I don't see the blood vessels very well, but I don't see rip-roaring obvious air bronchograms. So maybe an example of an air bronchogram would be kind of in this area here. Let's zoom in. I'm going to move it over. Okay. So in this area, I can see a little bit of pulmonary blood vessels. I'm going to use lines to show you what I'm seeing as vessels. Here's one. Here's another. There's another. Now I'm going to take them away so you can see. <laughs> or I'm going to use the tool wrong. Sorry about that. So as I move the lines, do you see how the pulmonary blood vessels, I can see them, there are linear soft tissue opacities extending into the lung, but their margins are fuzzy. This is a classic feature of an interstitial lung pattern. It doesn't have rip-roaring air bronchograms like this part of the lung, but those pulmonary blood vessels are not well seen. So in terms of lung pattern for this case, I would conclude that there's an alveolar lung pattern. The reason that I would land there is I like to consider interstitial and alveolar patterns to be a con sort of a continuous scale of severity, and I tend to name the lung pattern based on the most severe one that I think is present. Bronchial lung pattern often represents a totally different pathology, and I tend to keep that separate. 
So for me, if there's an alveolar lung pattern with lots of severe bronchograms, I tend to name the lung pattern as alveolar. Some people, when there's also an interstitial component, might say interstitial to alveolar, and I think that's fine too. Now for this case, the lung pattern, whether we agree on it as being interstitial or alveolar, either way, it's only going to get us so far. The next thing that we want to know, probably in all our cases, is actually just what's causing the lung pattern. So in this case, where I want to take the discussion is it's really hard to talk about lung patterns without talking about distribution. When I say distribution, I'm talking about where the lung lesion is located. I liked this example for us today because one, it gives us a chance to compare interstitial and alveolar in the same case. And second, it gives us a really marked distribution that I would characterize as cotodorsal. We already agreed that the worst affected lung lobe is that right caudal. So this is a fairly cotodorsal distribution. Some people might call it asymmetric as well. The distribution affects our differential. Things that tend to be cotodorsal, pulmonary edema, whether it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, would definitely be on the list. Things that tend to be cranioventral, which is not the case in this particular patient, tend to be pneumonia. We said that we could ca characterize it as cotodorsal, or we could also agree that it's asymmetric. Things that can have an unreliable distribution and can be quite asymmetric would include pulmonary contusion, which is definitely on the list for this case, as well as atelectasis. So where would I go with my conclusion about lung? For me, I would conclude that there's a cotodorsal distribution of an alveolar lung pattern. I would say that we could give the differential of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema potentially, but really only if we think that the dog experienced a cause of that, such as near drowning. If that 10 seconds underwater we don't think was associated with a near drowning episode, I'd be much more concerned based on the history that this is pulmonary contusion. Let's look for other signs of trauma in this case. I'm going to go to the lateral view. Can you appreciate on this view how ventral to the heart we have gas opacity and it gives us that vibe that the heart is displaced from the sternum? This, along with some of the clear margination of lung margins, like what we see here in the cotodorsal lung field and how the lung is displaced from the um, thoracic wall, these are great signs of pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, of course, is not surprising in a dog that has fallen from a height, and this can be a one-time thing that doesn't continue to leak over time, or if it's associated with um, any type of Ebola that could continue to leak, then this can um, contribute to ongoing pneumothorax. So to add to our confusion about what's causing this lung pattern, is it non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is rare, but could happen if there was a near drowning incident? Is it pulmonary contusion, because we have a great uh, history of trauma that would support that? Or how about atelectasis? Atelectasis is when the lung is not fully inflated. And we know that in this case, the lung can't be fully inflated because we have air in the pleural space taking up some of that room. I just want to make sure that I'm going to take these arrows out of the way to make sure that everyone sees the cotodorsal lung margin. I'm using a line to show it to you. This is what I see as the cotodorsal margin of that lung lobe. Therefore, this space here is representing pneumothorax. So in terms of whether or not you need to tap this pneumothorax, that's definitely going to be a clinical decision. Knowing that there's significant pathology in the lung, or at least a substantial lung pattern, that could also be affecting respiratory signs that you see. So pulling it all together, we wanted to focus on lung patterns today. And this is a great example of an alveolar pattern with some interstitial component as well. We recognize that that's probably a continuum. I think this is a great example of how we can use not just the radiograph, but the clinical history of a fall, along with the distribution of the lung lesion to help us decide about what could be possible. Um, and lastly, a great example of a little bit of pneumothorax. So I think that in this case, we would consider stabilizing the patient, repeating radiographs, and what we'd want to see is that the pneumothorax is not progressing, pulmonary contusions, if this is indeed what's happening, I suspect in the right caudal lung lobe, can get worse over time. So especially if the respiratory condition changes, you'd want to recheck this to see. I hope this helps clarify findings for this case and another example of why as a radiologist, we rely on you for your clinical impressions, as well as a great history to help really pull things together. So be sure to review the full report associated with this case and join us next week for further examples of fun with lung patterns. Thanks for listening. And remember, it's your case. So please post any questions on social media.